All right. No, any of you that are wiseacres, you're not on a cooking channel, okay? I know you see the canola oil and you see some other lubricants, including the original Singer uh, motor lubricant uh, grease that was designed specifically for these motors. Uh, but the reason I have canola oil out, believe it or not, I've had people that have contacted me and said that they've used different edible oils. Uh, everything from canola, canola oil to Greek type oils uh, in their sewing machine motor. And some of them swear by them. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I highly would not recommend it, particularly after going through this machine that you're going to see shortly on the workbench that belongs to Sandy, who's a local lady that I met. And she said, Scott, I've had this machine for a while. Uh, it's always done a good job. And then my boyfriend got his hands on it and he decided to try to lubricate the motor. I believe he used some sort of a petroleum jelly, but I'm not absolutely sure. And now it's overheating. I mean, it's actually hot to the touch. It's lost all of its power and it's basically just dead. Can you help me? Well, after probably three to four hours, and you would have seen some of those pictures probably up on Facebook uh, that I posted of taking this motor apart. And again, the featherweight motor is a 0.4 amp motor. It's not a huge motor, but it's got all the same components that you would find in any of the other Singer type motors. And all of those parts were coated and caked and greased with probably, and again, I'm just going based on experience, I'm guessing that there was a mineral type oil applied, which is a non-petroleum product. Now there's other lubricants as well. Like I said, believe it or not, some people have actually tried to use cooking edible type oils on their motors. I would argue it's not going to it's not going to get you a great outcome because it's going to leave a resin behind that's going to become just caked up on all of those electrical field parts and you're going to eventually have some failure on that motor so stick with something like this if you can't get your hands on this then you're going to want to explore products that are not going to leave a residue behind in that motor that are going to not be crude oil based. And I've come up with a mixture myself that I use on all of my motors. And I did use it on this motor as well after it was cleaned out of all the other junk. Uh, again, it looked like it was mineral oil. Um, don't use any oils. Don't use WD-40. Don't use all-purpose lubricants. Any of this stuff, please. Keep your canola oil in the kitchen. Don't try using it on your sewing machine motor. Um, I think that I was talking to uh, a gentleman that probably was puffed up with pride and didn't want to admit that he junked up his motor using a food-based cooking oil product like this on his sewing machine motor. Uh, but he, he told a good story. I'll just leave it at that. So stick with something like this. Can you use Vaseline? on a motor like this. A number of my friends, some of whom I respect, argue yes, but it has to be a specific type of petroleum jelly. It can't have fragrances in it and a number of other uh, byproducts that are, that are gonna create the same problems that some of these other lubricants do that are on my workbench. Don't use WD-40 on your sewing machine anywhere, uh, plain and simple. So. Here we've got um, a resurrected, if you'll allow me, Singer Featherweight 221 that belongs to Sandy from Oconto, Wisconsin. And Sandy loves this machine. She refers to this machine as her baby. And I get it. You know, my thing is I call them the Princess of Singers, but you know what? Princess of Singers, baby. This is her go-to machine. She certainly has other machines as well, but this is the one that she takes to a lot of her quilting retreats, like Mary Ann, who I introduced you to, that has a real cool newer version of a Husqvarna that was actually made in Sweden. These ladies are friends, uh, as is a couple of other ladies that I've been privileged to meet through their quilting network. 
and they will fight a cougar if it comes too close to one of their quilting machines. And that's certainly the case with this 221. So I was determined not to give up on that motor. Uh, can you buy a replacement motor? Yes. But I wanted to see if I could bring that onto the ashes. And I think you'll agree once you see the sew-offs that I'm going to do that I did. So the first thing we're going to sew off on is going to be genuine cowhide leather. I'm going to do a single layer. And I think a single layer, which is close to three to four ounces of uh, genuine cowhide leather, is going to prove that this machine has that power back in that 0.4 amp motor. Um, I mean, I did everything I could. It's going to be as close to or better than when I've gotten other machines that have not had this specific issue of the motor being contaminated with something that it should never ever have had in it. So follow me down to the needle. Let's see what we can do with this genuine cowhide leather. Should have some sort of music on or something, suspenseful music, but we're just going to play it straight. So here we go. A um, fairly thick piece of genuine cowhide leather, and this again is going to be the 221 that had major, major motor issues. Here we go. I uh, should have worn different shoes. <laughs> Hold on one second. Having the clutch engaged is always a good principle. I think I was going to fire this up, which I'll do afterwards so you can hear the motor without a load. Here we go. It runs beautifully again. And I can tell you, reaching out and touching the motor, it is cool to the touch and does not have any of the issues that it had when it came to the workshop. And I can also tell you that this stitch is absolutely drop dead gorgeous. The spacing, the formation, uh, the integrity of the stitch is absolutely spot on. And if I turn it over, and I've got to kind of pull it back for you to see it, but that lock stitch is equally gorgeous, and it really, really drove it into the nap of that uh, genuine cowhide leather. And the stitches are just really, really beautiful. And why shouldn't they be? The Singer Featherweight 221 is known for having one of the loveliest stitches of any of the machines in the Singer family. So let's do a little bit now a little bit of a sew off on this US Army grade canvas. We're just gonna buzz around it a little bit uh, and give this machine a chance to show its stuff after it was really, really close uh, to death. So I'm gonna put that presser foot down and we're just gonna kinda buzz around a little bit and uh, listen to the motor if you would, I'll be quiet. All right, nothing fancy, just a little circular sewing. You ever feel in life like you're just going in circles? All right, I know that was a shameless attempt at humor, but uh, you know what? It really comes down to trying to do everything I can for every single machine that hits this workbench. And, you know, this, this motor was in a position where it could have gone either way. I, I have no doubt that going to another uh, sewing location, um, you know, somewhere in this area or anywhere in the country for that matter, that there would not have been any attempt to do what I did to this motor. So I, I feel real good about that. I really do. And, and I'm hoping that this machine will continue to serve uh, my new friend, Sandy. Uh, extremely well for many many years. I'm going to zoom in on these stitches and just kind of show them off a little bit to you so you can see them up close. So 
So here's our genuine cowhide. And I'll try to go real slow across. Not the best angle for it, but it really is a spectacular uh, looking stitch on there. And if we go up to here, I love this stuff because you know why? It really presents stitches well. You can just see the formation and integrity and the flow of that stitch. Some of these turns that I did, the spacing, the formation, everything about those stitches is just absolutely spot on. And when it comes to the integrity of a stitch, I mean, especially if you're in the quilting circles that Sandy and Marianne and my other new friend, uh, Janet, that I've met, you know what? You better have a good looking stitch. Otherwise, you better pack it up and go home. And if I turn this over, you're going to have a chance to see the lock stitch as well on both of these. It's going to be tough on this genuine cowhide leather, to be honest, uh, because that stitch is really, really driven in. But I'll, I'll zoom in on it, and you can see what you potentially can see. But again, these are, uh, these are really, really good looking lock stitches on here. And the little white tufting you see is just a byproduct of that uh, U.S. Army grade canvas. You can see down here, really especially on that curve, just how lovely, spectacular those stitches are. So, I would call this, without a doubt, uh, a huge success. A huge success from the standpoint of restoring as much of the power of that motor as I possibly could. Do I believe that it's uh, equal to another featherweight that would not have gone through that horrific um, uh, trauma of having that uh, foreign uh, lubricant in there and then the machine uh, operating with that lubricant in there and it uh, you know overheating and just having a number of other challenges? Probably not but I would say that it's equal to or better than when it left the factory. <laughs> and I say that intentionally because I always try to exceed what machines can do. And as I told you, I met a couple of folks that used to sell machines door to door for Singer. And they become uh, strong followers and friends and fans of what I try to do with vintage machines. And they told me without batting an eye that uh, my machines, with the sew-offs that they've seen, outperform what the machines that they had just picked up at the factory were capable of doing uh, back in the day. And that's a good feeling. It's a good feeling also to hear something like this after, if you had been here when I put this on the workbench before I did anything to it, the pulley on that motor with no load was barely turning. It was making a, a sound almost like it was grinding metal to metal. And uh, Sandy can attest to that. Uh, she was here when we plugged it in. And uh, now, with no load, and even coming over the balance wheel with a belt, so I guess technically there's some modest load on the machine, but it's not turning the shaft that goes to the needle. Listen to this motor now. I'm even going to zoom in on that balance wheel so you can see the revolution speed of this. And then again, use your imagination as to how it was operating just about 24 hours ago when I first got my hands on this machine and started to try to do my magic on it. Here we go again.
You get the idea? Making a difference is really my ultimate goal. Every single machine that I have the privilege to work on, I want to make a difference. And I definitely feel, in this instance, as I prepare to get this machine back to Sandy today, that I've made a huge difference with this machine. And also a lesson learned for all of you again, as you look at the prospect of trying other types of lubricants, you can find all kinds of advice on the internet. Good advice, bad advice, and everything in between. Um, you need to be real careful. You need to be real, real careful on where you go for advice. Um, I believe that Sandy said her boyfriend had found the recommendation in using the type of oil that he did uh, on the internet. Someone recommended it. But recommendations without knowledge and experience are really just a guess, a hope, a prayer that everything will work out. Kind of like this gentleman I dealt with a while ago uh, that said that he used uh, some, torps, some type of Greek salad dressing type oil on his machine and it works great. Um, sorry, not buying it. If you offer me a bridge, I'm not going to buy the bridge either. So follow my recommendation of searching out if you're going to lubricate um, a featherweight motor. And there's really only one point on that motor that you have to lubricate it. As you look over the top of the machine, it's going to be on the right side. And all that lubricant does is add a little bit of, of uh, slip or uh, uh, lubrication uh, so it slips more easily. The shaft that's going to come out and attach to that pulley, that's it. You're not lubricating any other part of the motor. So whatever you decide to use, choose carefully. Again, don't let it be a heavy petroleum-based lubricant. Never use WD-40. Never use multi-purpose lubricants. Never use PT Blaster or some other crazy stuff like that. Uh, choose carefully. Okay? All right. So I'm getting ready to get this machine back to Sandy. Thanks for being a subscriber. Thanks for crossing your fingers and toes as I worked late into the night last night to bring this motor back to life again. Yes.